Welcome to this course. My name is Rice, Charlie Rice. I am a professor of law at the University of Notre Dame, where I teach jurisprudence, constitutional law, and torts. And uh, we're going to be uh, doing this course on the natural law. And since we start our classes with a prayer, let's do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first question you ought to be asking here is, uh, what is the natural law? And the first thing to note is that everything has a nature. If you drop a rock in a pond, it's going to sink. If you go down and eat a barbed wire sandwich, you're not going to feel too well. But we're talking about the natural moral law. And the best way to start talking about it is to contrast it with the culture in which we live. And that culture in which we live is a product of the Enlightenment. I'm going to We're going to leave out the, the vowels for time. We only have 55 minutes here. Later on, when we get really pressed for time, we'll leave out the consonants too. But the Enlightenment has three basic premises. One is secularism. Secularism is the idea that uh, God doesn't exist or he, he doesn't care. Uh, the Supreme Court in our, in our country has, has adopted the idea that uh, government has to be neutral as to the very existence of God. So that it is technically unconstitutional for a public official, whether a president or a school teacher, to affirm as a fact that uh, the Declaration of Independence is true when it says there's a God. As Justice Brennan said in one case, uh, the words unto God and the revised Pledge of Allegiance may merely mean that this nation was believed to have been founded under God. The second uh, premise here is relativism. The universities are full of professors who are absolutely sure they can't be sure of anything. There's one case right here at Notre Dame where a, uh, uh, a, a geology prof of all things came into the first class in the course, and uh, he said, uh, the, this happened quite a few years ago, he said, the first thing I want you to understand is that there are no absolutes. And the son of a friend of ours in the back row put up his hand and he said, are you absolutely sure about that? And relativism is the uh, idea or the uh, concept that, that nobody can know what's right or wrong. Uh, Rene Descartes, and we'll talk about him a little bit later, said essentially that the only thing you can know are your own ideas. Aristotle and St. Thomas tell us that you can know the external world, you can know the essences of things. Descartes defined an idea as that which we know. So that uh, all you can know are your own ideas. You can't know what's out there. You can't know it. St. Thomas said, on the other hand, an idea is that by which we know, by which we know uh, the real world. And we have adopted uh, relativism in our constitutional law and in our culture. Take, for example, <coughs> the constitutional freedom of speech. Why is it so difficult to uh, regulate pornography? Why uh, uh, is it so difficult to prevent libelous statements or to give redress for libelous statements? Uh, uh, why is there uh, such protection for uh, speech uh, which is really harmful speech? And the uh, the reason is, is philosophical. The idea is that nobody can know what's right or wrong. And if nobody knows what's right or wrong, uh, who's to say 
uh, whether speech is harmful uh, or not. Speech becomes a datum. It becomes a scientific datum. The only method of, of trying to find truth is the scientific method. And, and all these things have to be collected as, as data. So when you have the Mapplethorpe photographs, where you have uh, uh, homoerotic photographs of, uh, 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 of, of guys in, in various poses with various things uh, protruding from their anatomy, uh, who's to say that that is not worthwhile speech? The only speech today <clears throat> which uh, effectively can be precluded by the law is uh, imminent incitement uh, to violence, uh, which is likely to produce that effect. Or you take religion. The basic premise of uh, relativism and secularism is, it, uh, is that uh, any statement about God is by definition non-rational. And since any statement by, about God is non-rational, it really has no place in the public discourse. Why? Because uh, that should be reserved for rational discourse. And nobody can know anything about God. George Mason, on the other hand, one of the great lawyers of the colonial period uh, and who later served in the Constitutional Convention in 1787, argued a case uh, Robin against Hardaway in 1772 where uh, he was arguing against a slavery law. And he argued against it on the ground that it was contrary to the law of God. He won the case on another basis. But the interesting thing is that uh, he would never be allowed to do that today. And he certainly would not be uh, nominated and confirmed uh, for the federal bench. So that is one of the basic premises that we deal with today. Secularism, relativism. Another is individualism. Individualism is the idea that uh, each autonomous individual is essentially his own God. And that we have no intrinsic relation to others. And, and it's not accidental. It, it comes uh, out of a, a philosophical base. Uh, St. Thomas and Aristotle or what, talked about human nature. They, they talked about uh, the human uh, person, Aristotle, said man is a political animal. Saying, uh, Thomas uh, said, yes, man, man is built to live in community. He's a social being. Uh, not so here. The social contract theory with Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau postulates the beginning of society from a a mythical state of nature. And in this state of nature, you have all these individuals milling around, and they're all autonomous, isolated individuals, all by themselves. They're just autonomous, isolated individuals. Uh, Hobbes tells us that in that state of nature, uh, it's a pretty nasty place. Life is solitary, poor, brutish, nasty, and short. And Hobbes tells us that in order to uh, preserve their lives, really, uh, and uh, survive, people get together and form the state. So for Hobbes, you form the state, you turn over your, all power to the Leviathan, to the state, uh, except incidentally for the power over your own life, and uh, the power not, to, the right not to incriminate yourself, interestingly. But except for that, you turn over all your, all your power to the state. Even the state, the state can even define religion. Locke, for Locke, the state of nature was a, a more benign place. But you needed a, a common judge. And to obtain a common judge and to protect rights, people formed the state. And for Rousseau, people formed the state to carry out the general will. Now, there are two things about this. One is that there is a basic question throughout this whole thing 
where you're dealing with the state. Your question is, is there anything higher? Is there a higher standard than the state? The Christian tradition, Augustine, the common law, St. Thomas, tell us that God is higher than the state, that the state derives its authority from God. The social contract theory doesn't say the state derives its authority vertically from God. It says the state derives its authority horizontally from the people. Huge difference. And if you derive your authority from the people, if the people give rights, and the people define rights and define authority, then the people can change it. Huge difference. Hannah Arendt mentioned that in one of her uh, articles. And she said the climactic change in uh, jurisprudence in this respect came with the French Declaration of, rights of the Rights of Man in 1789, which proclaimed that rights came from man, but they didn't come from God or from history or any other external source. Big difference. And it relates to the question of whether the state is limited. And when we get into the natural law, you'll see that as a limit on the power of the state. So the social contract theory was important in that respect. And it's important also in terms of its notion of the human person. As I mentioned before, St. Thomas tells us that uh, the person is social by nature. Uh, later on, we'll see how John Paul II uh, and the Magisterium carry that even further. But the person is, is, of his nature, made to live in community. <clears throat> the social contract theory uh, tells us that the foundation of the community is not the nature of the human person, uh, which is uh, social by nature, but the foundation of the human community of all relations is consent. Under this concept, you are bound to others only to the extent that you consent. Each individual is that isolated, autonomous individual standing there by himself. And he has relation to others uh, only to the extent that he consents. This is the origin of pro-choice. Planned Parenthood didn't think it up. Even the mother doesn't have relation to the child in her womb unless she consents. The husband and wife do not have a continuing relation to each other unless they continue to consent. Your participation in society is a product of consent. And you, the question is, what are the limits on the state? What are the limits on the majority? And these are the questions we're going to deal with. Coming out of this system, this enlightenment idea, in jurisprudential terms, is the jurisprudential idea of legal positivism. The leading uh, positivist of this century is Hans Kelsen, who was an Austrian, uh, who was a very uh, rigorously honest individual and uh, very clear. And Kelsen said that the the purpose of law is to carry out the basic norms of society. And uh, he contrasted, Kelsen, he, he contrasted philosophical absolutism, philosoph philosophical absolutism, which is what he called St. Thomas, a philosophical absolutist. Philosophical absolutism, the idea that you can actually know what's right or wrong, with what Kelsen called, and I'll try to make this shorter, uh, philosophical relativism, which was Kelsen's idea. The idea that nobody can know what's right or wrong. 
And Kelsen said that philosophical absolutism leads to political absolutism. Philosophical relativism, he said, where everybody agrees that nobody knows what's right or wrong, leads, he said, to democracy, where people will agree to let things be determined by the political process. Kelsen himself said the mind, since he was a, what he called a philosophical relativist, he said that uh, the mind cannot know the absolute. He said justice is an irrational ideal. Interesting. His ideas were influential in the first third of the 20th century. And he had the honesty, the candor, after the war, after the Second World War, to put it in writing, uh, to write and to say that he has to agree that the legal systems of Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union, and Mussolini's Italy, that those legal systems, he said, were valid law. Because for the legal positivist, Kelsen being typical, being the clearest exponent of it, for the legal positivist, a law is valid if it is enacted according to the proper forms, regardless of its content. As Kelsen put it, a law of any content can be a valid norm. So you can write down to the question, is there such a thing as an invalid law? Suppose uh, we were the Congress of the United States. And suppose we adopted the Joe Smith extermination law, he being a member of this class. Would that be a valid law? Well, your first objection would be, uh, hey, that's unconstitutional. That's right. It would be a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, depriving life without due process of law. So we make it the Joe Smith extermination amendment. The amendment would provide that Joe Smith will be plugged into the nearest wall outlet. He will be totaled, <coughs> executed. Is that a valid law? Well, if you're a legal positivist, you may say it's an unwise law. Hey, Joe would be a good guy to keep around. But you can't say it's invalid. Why? Because you don't recognize any standard of right and wrong higher than the state. Why? Because nobody can know what's right or wrong. The epistemology is crucial here. And once you adopt the idea, as Kelsen did, and as our culture has, once you adopt the idea that nobody can know what's right or wrong, then uh, what basis do you have to criticize uh, a law as being unjust? So if we're debating that uh, Joe Smith extermination law, and somebody in the Congress, uh, and, and we're the Congress, somebody in the Congress jumps up and says, hey, that's unjust. The proper response for a legal positivist would be to say, stop emoting. Because that's not a rational reaction. Because nobody can know what is just. Now, several things follow from this. One is, for example, law becomes will. Law as will. Law as will. In the uh, abortion situation, New York State in 1970 passed what was then the most uh, uh, permissive abortion law in the world. And Bob Byrne, one of the absolutely great unsung heroes of the pro-life movement, was a law professor at Fordham. Got himself appointed as the guardian for the unborn children of New York State 
to raise their constitutional rights to prevent their abortion. And he won uh, in the lower court. And then it was reversed by the appellate court and then by the highest court of the state of New York. It was interesting. The state of New York, the highest court of New York said this. They said in the Byrne case, B-Y-R-N, uh, against the commissioner of hospitals in 1972. The court said, number one, the child in the womb, the unborn child, is a human being. They found it as a fact that the unborn child is a human being. And then they said, number two, that it is up to the legislature to decide which human beings are persons. And for that proposition, they cited, among others, Hans Kelsen. Properly so. Because if nobody knows what's just, if nobody knows what's right or wrong, then you can't say that there's a, an intrinsic relation and connection between humanity and personhood. In a, in a society where a, a constitutional personhood is the condition of having rights, as it is here. We, I mean, to, be a, to have rights under our constitution, you have to be a person. A natural law approach of the kind that we're going to be talking about here would say that in the nature of things, all human beings have to be regarded as persons. But if you're a legal positivist, you can't know anything. You can't know the essence of things. You can't know anything about nature in that sense. There's no knowable standard of justice higher than the state. So personhood is a matter for legislative de determination. That's Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court uh, did not decide the Byrne case. They uh, uh, took two other cases where there was not a finding of fact that the unborn child is a human being. And then they fudged it. The court said, well, nobody knows whether this is human life. In the meantime, they had the burn case in their files. And then later on, having put it off and decided these other two cases, where they said that the child is not a person before birth, the court said that the burn case is dismissed for want of a federal question. So. In this situation, Thomas, St. Thomas, and Aristotle would say that law is reason. Aquinas, we would contrast Aquinas with this. Law is reason. Every law, I mean, every human law has, has an element of will in that the law has to be promulgated. The law has to be enforced. But the basis of law is reason. Cicero said this, as we'll mention later on. That law is reason. But if nobody knows what's right or wrong, if nobody uh, can know anything, what do you have to reason about? That's law as will. The other, one other thing that happens here is a functional definition of the person. The person is defined functionally. A functional definition. What does that mean? Well, uh, in the Cruzan case in 1990, where the Supreme Court upheld the, uh, what in moral terms is the murder of Nancy Cruzan by withdrawing, uh, said Missouri can allow, can require clear and convincing evidence before they authorize her killing. In that case, Justice Stevens, in his opinion, I could read it to you, let me just tell you about it, said that he doubted that Nancy Cruzan is even alive. And she was in a persistent vegetative state. I saw the bedside interview with Nancy Cruzan, where she was there and, and she smiled. She would uh, respond to jokes. She was in a persistent vegetative state, which is kind of an awake unconsciousness. But Justice Stevens says, I doubt that she's even alive because of her unconscious condition and the fact that she has no chance of recovery. This is a functional definition of personhood. It's what the Nazis called the useless eaters. 
I mean, you are regarded as a person if you can do something. You're not a person because of who you are, but because of what you can do. Very important. And it is a utilitarian uh, concept, of course. Jeremy Bentham said the person in the 19th century, Jeremy Bentham said the purpose of law is to promote the greatest good of the greatest number. And he defined good as happiness, pleasure. The maximization of pleasure, the avoidance of pain. And we're dealing here with a, uh, a culture which has uh, reenacted, in a sense, the Dred Scott case of uh, 1857, where the Supreme Court held that uh, free descendants of slaves could not be citizens, and they said that slaves were property rather than persons. We have uh, reenacted that, it, and uh, we're in this uh, situation where it becomes a matter of politics rather than reason and where there are no limits uh, to what the law can do. Now let me put this in a uh, schematic framework if I can. Uh, St. Thomas, <clears throat> as we'll mention later on, said there are four kinds of law. One is the eternal law. I'm not even going to read that. The eternal law, all right, which is God's concept of things, basically. God doesn't make plans and carry them out next Tuesday because there's no time in eternity. <clears throat> but the eternal law. Another, taking a little bit out of order, is the divine law. Revelation. The Old Testament, the New Testament, in the Catholic tradition as interpreted by the teaching church. Then the natural law. The natural law. Which is a participation of man in the eternal law. It's a rule of reason whereby we uh, 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 know how to act. It's knowable to reason. Only then do you have the human law. The human law. Now, <clears throat> what uh, we're talking about in our culture, and, the, and you have to understand this in order to understand what the natural law means in the context of that culture, is that for a long time, we have tried to organize society, the Enlightenment philosophers and politicians for the last three centuries have tried to organize society as if God doesn't, doesn't exist. If they talk about natural law, they talk about it below that line. They won't talk about the lawgiver who is God. But they'll talk about the natural law, but won't affirm anything about the divine law or the eternal law. Why? Because nobody can know anything about that. And the natural law, again, is something that uh, nobody can really know about because, again, based on the relativist idea, nobody can know anything about anything. So you say, well, how does this all work? Well, let me offer a suggestion. We, I don't want to run out of time here, but uh, let's look at it this way. We want to look at the natural law. We want to see what it can do for us in the context of this society. Well, you know, one of the basic things is that every society, as, as every person, has to have a God. You have to have an ultimate authority. Now, it's going to be the real God, or it's going to be Ann Landers, or it's going to be somebody. Every society has to have a God. And if it's not the real God, it's going to be man, and ultimately it's going to be the state. Now, a few years ago, there was a, uh, an interesting little monograph that was published by William Bennett called The Index of Leading Cultural Indicators. And Bennett took... Uh, the statistical profile of the United States on, in various respects relating to family and morals and all the rest of that, divorce, uh, out of wedlock pregnancies, uh, violence, all, all of that, family, 
And he showed how there had been such a dramatic decline between 1960 and 1990. And there really was. It was a dramatic decline. And the question arises, should arise, what happened back then? What happened back in the 60s that caused that to, to occur? And uh, it's really pretty simple. I mean, ideas have consequences. And two things, let me suggest to you. In 1961, 2, and 3, through 63, 1961 through 63, starting with the Torcaso case in Maryland where uh, Maryland had a requirement that public officials have to declare a belief in God. And the Supreme Court said that that uh, is a violation of the Establishment Clause because Maryland is violating its neutrality between religions that believe in God and those that don't. And in the following two years in school prayer cases, the Supreme Court declared its neutrality on God. So the United States government is officially neutral as to the existence of God. And as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's not the way it started. And every state has to have a God. Instead, what is happening here, as Justice Brennan said, is that it's theoretically unconstitutional for a public official to acknowledge as a fact, not just as, in Brennan's terms, ceremonial deism, but as a fact that, uh, that God exists. And this involves also neutrality on morals. That's why in these public school programs where they, they deal with sex education, homosexual business and all that, uh, you, can't, you have to do it non-judgmentally because the state cannot take a moral position. That's a big deal. You know why? Because from that time on, generation of genera after generation of public school children have, uh, have, has come through the system without ever seeing the state in the person of their teachers acknowledge that there's a standard of right and wrong higher than the state, right up there. That's a big deal. Because if there's no standard of right and wrong higher than the state, that really changes your attitude toward things. And the other thing that happened back then, 1962, the FDA gave final approval to the pill, the contraceptive pill. You say, well, what does this have to do with natural law? Well, it has a lot to do with it. The, uh, Decisive impact of this is increasingly evident. As Pope Paul pointed out in 1968, you know, in, in Humanae Vitae, and at this university and other places, uh, uh, he gets a bad press. In Catholic, uh, a lot of Catholic circles generally. But as Pope Paul pointed out, contraception is wrong because it separates the unitive and the procreative aspects of sex. Pope Paul also, incidentally, in Humanae Vitae, said that if the contraceptive ethic is accepted, that woman will come to be regarded as an object. And uh, nobody's laughing at, at him anymore in that respect because that's so obviously true. John Paul II added on to this, expanded this. And in Familiaris Consortio, he said, you know, one of the other things that's wrong with this is that it makes man the arbiter of when life begins. And he said, another thing that's wrong with it is that it destroys communication. We're going to get into this later. But the 
but, but sexual activity is supposed to be a, a total, conjugal act is supposed to be a total self-donation. And John Paul is saying that uh, contraception, on the other hand, is a lie. Because it overrides uh, that with a contrary message. I, I will not give, you, give myself to you totally. I will not accept you unless you're changed. And we look at all these crazy things, you know, that are happening today. And uh, we say, how did this all get, how does this all go so crazy? That's pretty simple. Because if you put all these things together, we've rejected the idea of a law of nature, we've rejected the idea of an objective moral standard, we've adopted secularism, we've adopted relativism, we've adopted individualism. So each one is his own moral standard, his own moral authority. And why are we surprised? We go from contraception, secularism, relativism, individualism to contraception. What else, what else can we expect? Well, abortion is really a dramatic separation of sex from life. And if man is the arbiter, man being both sexes, if man is the arbiter of when life begins, why are we surprised when he makes himself the arbiter of when life ends, as in abortion <clears throat> or as in euthanasia? Abortion is just prenatal euthanasia. Euthanasia is just postnatal abortion. Why are we surprised with uh, in vitro fertilization? Where Human life <clears throat> begins not, uh, uh, not through the, uh, as the natural law, as the church would, would, would declare, would affirm, uh, not through the, the conjugal act of love, but human life begins on the dish. You know, interestingly, when Louise Brown was, was born in 1978, she was the first test tube baby. My mother, the dish. I mean, she began, but everybody in the world knew exactly when her life began on the dish. And then she was implanted into the womb. And of course, what that does is separate where contraception takes the, tries to take the unitive while rejecting the procreative in vitro fertilization tries to take the procreative while rejecting the unitive. Interestingly, in contraception, you don't even get the unitive because through drugs or plugs, you frustrate the communication, which is essential to the conjugal act. Cloning. I mean, what, what else? Hey, if uh, man is the arbiter of when and how life begins, why not? Why not? It's all a question of who's in charge. Or you, you talk about uh, all this business about homosexual activity. I mean, if there's, if there's no God, and nobody knows what's right or wrong, and the standard is up to each individual, and there's no intrinsic relation between sex and life, sex and procreation, and if each of us is the arbiter, the, uh, the judge, the determiner of whether and when there will be that, create, that connection, well, then why can't Freddie and Harry get a marriage license? What reason other than the aesthetic or the pragmatic? Or, you know, everybody's excited today about teenage promiscuity, out of, worth, out of uh, wedlock births and that, that kind of business. Everybody's excited about divorce particularly with its effect on children. There's no, no mystery about it. In the natural order of things, in the natural law, children ought to be raised by parents who stay together. And in the natural order of things, sex should be reserved for marriage. Why? Because sex has something to do with babies. I mean, anybody can figure that out. 
But if sex does not intrinsic, intrinsically have anything to do with babies, I think kids are smart enough, they can figure it out. If the individual is the arbiter for himself as to whether and when sex will have anything to do with babies, And if the individual can make that determination all by himself, why should sex be reserved for marriage? And why should marriage be permanent? Or you talk about pornography. As I mentioned before, they laughed at Pope Paul when he said that woman will be regarded as an object. But that's exactly what it is. And all these things Happen. And what, uh, what, what does it end up as? Well, it ends up really as what Pope John Paul called a culture of death. And you know what? One of the uh, striking examples of that is in the Timothy McVeigh verdict, where the jury voted for the death penalty. You know, it, interestingly, the, the judge said to the jury, you are responsible to nobody. Now, a judge wouldn't have said that 200 years ago. But he did. He said, you are not, you're responsible to nobody except yourself. You are God. And they interviewed some woman in Oklahoma City after the verdict came out. And she said, when somebody does that, he ceases to be human. Referring to McVeigh. And there are just two ways of looking at this, folks. And we're going to get into this later. But Pope John Paul looks at it differently, and John Paul says, hey, not even the murderer loses his dignity. And he puts severe restrictions on capital punishment. You know why? I think, I used to be in favor of it. I used to argue very strongly for it. But John Paul has put it on a different ball, ball game. John Paul has taken the natural law and has incorporated it, as we will mention later, into the teaching of Christ. John Paul has said the state is not God. That there is a law higher than the state. And that death is not a solution. The only two times morally when anybody can ever intentionally kill anybody are in the just war and in capital punishment. And these are severely limited. The state has, in theory, the right to impose capital punishment, but it is restricted only when it is absolutely necessary and not otherwise possible to protect society from this criminal. And what John Paul is doing here is raising the challenge to the power of the state, to the culture of death. And the only way to do that is on the basis of the natural law. The natural law, as I mentioned before, is not a Catholic invention. Aristotle affirmed it. Cicero affirmed it very strongly. The great Roman jurist. Cicero said the uh, law is reason and nature. So the law contrary to nature and reason is void. And in the Nazi situation, we had a good example of that. During the war, the German, uh, in, the, in the German concentration camps, they did certain things. And later on, uh, let me give you an example. They would conduct experiments. And these were good experiments, in the sense that they were useful. They were trying to devise anticoagulants to stop people from bleeding to death. Or they're trying to, I'm sorry, they were trying to devise coagulants to stop people from bleeding to death. 
And you know how they did it? They would, they would inject a prisoner in a concentration camp or a prisoner of war with the coagulant that they were testing, and then they would cut off a limb and measure how long it took him to bleed to death. Or they were trying to devise flight suits that would keep aviators alive longer if they were uh, downed in the North Sea, in the freezing water. And so they would take a prisoner and they would hook him up to electrodes to measure his responses and they would put him in the flight suit and put him in, in a tub of freezing water and measure how long it took him to die. And for these and other experience, experiments of a similar kind, uh, various doctors were tried after the war in the West German courts. Now, their defense was, hey, these are the Nazi cases. Experiments. Their defense was this was authorized by the law. I'll give you another one. In the, the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, relating to property owned by Jews, if a Jew was out of the country, or if he thereafter left the country, his property would be given, would be taken by the state. All right? Now, after the war, the Jewish property owner came back. The state had transferred his property to A, all right? And the Jewish property owner sues A to get his property back. Who wins? Who gets the property. How do you decide that? That was the law. That was a valid law, according to Hans Kelsen. All right? How can you say that the law is void? How can you say that? Unless you're going to say that there's something in nature that prevents even the state from doing this kind of thing. I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? How do, how do you think the German courts dealt with that? I'll, I'll tell you what they did. They dealt with that. They said the doctors had no defense. They said, why? Because there is a law of nature. There's a natural law. And they said when the, the, the conflict between the enacted law and justice reaches unendurable proportions, the enacted law must fail. They said the Jewish property owner could get his property back, right? Or compensation. Why? Because they said there is what they called a suprapositive, that is above the positive law, a suprapositive principle of equality and of property. What were they doing? Natural law. And they called it that. And they said only in extreme cases should this be applied. But when that conflict reaches unendurable proportions, then the enacted law has to fail. Now we're going to get into the natural law. We're going to talk about it. We're going to try to examine uh, how it works. What we've done this time in this uh, preliminary class is we just kind of sketched out the fact that, that what we're contending with here is a culture that is a product of the Enlightenment. Secularism, relativism, individualism. Leading in the legal sphere to legal positivism, the idea that nobody can know what's right or wrong. Therefore, whatever the law decides is valid. Now, if the law decides that the unborn child, when he is almost entirely out of the womb, is still not a person because the abortion is not finished and can have his brain sucked out, then according to legal positivism, that's a valid law. According to legal positivism, the unborn child can be defined as a non-person in the womb. 
according to the natural law, all human beings must be treated as persons. And we've seen this utilitarian, depersonalized approach to things. And we've seen it through the combination of the, uh, you know, the effect on our law of this neutrality on God combined with the big rock candy mountain for hedonists and for individualists, the contraceptive pill. So that now at last man has the ability to control his own procreation. And what we are seeing is a, a collection of results uh, which would be mystifying if they were not referred back to these basic principles. And for this, the natural law is the remedy. But your question uh, has to be, what is the natural law? And how do you know what it is? How does it operate? And that's what we'll pick up uh, with the next class. We'll uh, get into that kind of question where you, you look back and you say, well, those West German courts, yeah, they were right. And saying there have to be limits on what the state can do. There have to be limits. And where you take a, a prisoner and you cut off his arm to test a coagulant, uh, no law can justify that. But the only way you can affirm that is by affirming that there is a law of nature higher than the state, something that the state cannot change. And that's what we will uh, get into uh, next time. Thank you.